G'day everyone and welcome back to the Cyber Minutes podcast. My name is Max, as always, and I'm joined by Flynn. So let's get right into it. There's a few interesting things happening this week that are in the news as well as a bit more of, you know, overarching signs that things are changing in the cybersecurity environment that we live in today. Big one that, you know, everyone's sort of taken, that's taken everywhere by storm is the TikTok ban in the United States. So Flynn, do you want to talk a little bit about what this is and what this entails? Yeah, so basically there's been security uh, concerns in Australia and America, and I'm sure basically the whole Western world about TikTok because it is owned by a Chinese company. In Australia, for example, it is banned uh, from being used in government environments. But in America, Basically, the discussion is the American government was looking to buy the Chinese company that owns TikTok. And basically, they were saying they're going to have an outright ban of TikTok if they did not allow them to do that. It's very interesting because I think it makes complete sense within a government space. It's hard to say how much recon is the Chinese government using on with like TikTok and stuff like that because... If we're going to go down this path, mm. there are so many apps that are yeah. doing this. Oh, yeah. I was going to say, it's not just TikTok, the ones who are collecting no. data. And if you're saying collecting data for the purpose of giving it to the government, are we sure that Facebook and Microsoft haven't been doing this the whole time? I'm, I'm, I would be inclined to say it probably is actively happening. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's like, it's almost a double standard from the United States government saying that we want to control or at least have some level of moderation in terms of what data is being given to government bodies. But when someone else tries to do it, do it, no, either sell us the company or we'll ban your app from, you know, our biggest, your biggest customer base. I suppose that's the privilege you have when you're the most powerful nation in the world. Yeah. Um, Probably comes along with it. Yeah. But it is hard to say whether you do this. I don't know if you do it for the public. I think for now, the right step is the education piece. TikTok's not going anywhere, let's be honest. It's probably the biggest app in the world. Yep. But, you know, educating people that their data can be used for malicious activities is useful for TikTok, but it's also going to be useful for everything. Because once TikTok's down, there's going to be another thing that replaces it. Yeah, Yeah, there's always something something else. And it comes back to exactly what, like you said, the education piece, telling people that you shouldn't be putting your kids, you know, on TikTok. You shouldn't be putting pictures of yourself or your house or your city or where you live, you know, all that stuff is not only a danger to you, but it's the people around you as well. If someone wants is out to get you, then, you know, you're showing them where you live, what your kids look like, right? It's a, it's a big, uh, it's a damaging thing as well as potentially you're, you're handing over data to foreign governments, which, you know, generally not a, not a great sort of thing to be doing. Yeah. So I have actually a little bit of insight. Uh, one time I was working with a client that had this concern. Uh, they were a government body. Yep. And basically, they didn't quite have the budget to, you know, tackle like a, a corporate bubble sort of solution where once you walk into that network, you'd be completely banned from using that app. Okay. Um, they didn't quite have the resourcing for that. So it was a bit hard for us to do, but we basically just had to write a policy yep. for all employees that said like, you know, you can't use TikTok. Obviously, how effective is that going to be? How many Can't people are say. reading this policy? Yeah. And how addicting is TikTok? Like, people are probably going to be using it on yeah. that um, environment. Yeah. But it was the best we could do for now with the intention of this would move to that sort of corporate bubble. Um, and I think that's the best way to tackle it, really. So, if you walk into the network, you just uh, cannot access TikTok what, uh, whatsoever. My kind of understanding... So, they don't have uh, software or anything that does network admin on on their end would they uh because from my thinking is while ago (laughs) yeah my thinking is you should be able to blacklist certain networks or certain web domains and you should be able to if you're connected to the the wi-fi or the internet of a certain place then you should be able to ban any outgoing communications i think you can even do it in the rules of the router itself, like in the firmware. Yes. System. No, you def- it's definitely a solution you can do. Yeah. I can't remember exactly how. Like, it's not a very... The reason... It's, it's not... Like, that's not a very gracious approach, like manually putting in blacklists into the router, but, it, you know, it's, it's 
and there's also privacy concerns and stuff. So this yeah. um, entity didn't quite have a ban on it, but they were basically concerned it was it was coming, which is okay. why they wanted to be on top of it. Yeah. But yeah, you're right. Um, and then there's also privacy concerns as well. Like, you know, if we can go, they basically didn't want to go down the route of having control over devices because um, they knew that there was going to be really big concerns with employees because, yeah. you know, wiping devices and yeah. having device information. Even then, you should you shouldn't need full control. It's just when you're trying to connect to a certain website through a like a router, like you're you're having that connection go through the network of the workplace. That connection from your phone to the router to the website, I'm pretty sure you can stop it halfway. Yeah, you definitely can. Yeah, there was a reason. Why there was a reason. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember yeah. why. Um, it was some quite some time ago. Yeah, and I know there are. Obviously, like that is the solution you want to kind of. Yeah, aim for. most most companies that have more resourcing will have some kind of a a admin system like Zscaler or Netscope or you know even even Intune or something like that that allows you to selectively block types of websites, for example, TikTok or Instagram and stuff. But exactly like you said, they're not cheap; they're pretty expensive. You know what I think. I think it's because they're on a cloud environment. They didn't have their own network, which was the issue. Right. Okay. Um, hard to say. Though. Yeah. Could be anything, really. Yeah. Without yeah. So, yeah, having the specific case. Because, yeah, as you said, if you're on a specific router, yeah, you're depending can... on the router. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Although, I'm not sure if the how good, if you block a certain connection, I'm not sure how good it is at stopping like subdomains or, you know, different like probes of the same website like it's probably not i think it's true i think it's still good okay. um yeah. not so we might check that and come it, it also was partially concerns of you know employees using it because even if they can't access within that network mm. you know what if they try and find a workaround they try to find a workaround or you know they still have the there's a bring your own device environment so they still have oh. like files on their own personal computers and then if they go home and use tiktok yeah there's security concerns around tiktok it's a whole can of words, really. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But like we were saying, the ban on Chinese, you know, companies, the kind of, it's like an almost like a commercial war going on, really. Yeah. DJI, which is a very popular and very influential, very used, it's one of the biggest providers of drones in the market. DJI, they've been banned by, I think the United States government banned them from federal uh, use, which is the first, like it's the first step whenever you're going to ban something from a, from your government, is you ban it from government officials using it. Yeah. So they've gone and done that. They've banned it. So if you work in the United States government in any way, shape, or form, you're not allowed to own, purchase, possess, whatever, fly DJI products uh, at risk of them providing information to governments. Which the United States has a list of governments which, if you're if a product you're using is made by a certain manufacturer or a certain company in those list of countries, then it's banned. So China is obviously one of those. Obviously, North Korea as well. I don't know how many of us are running around with North Korean drones, but yeah. I think the, all those rocks. <laughs> rocks yeah. and GoPros. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think they do. Oh, I think it was also just the components. That the components yeah. came from. Those no, companies. yeah, I remember we were in contact with an Australian company that there isn't many Australian hardware companies nah. that make um, you know, chips, motherboards, yeah. CPUs. Yeah. Um, and basically what they were doing was making that stuff within Australia because the Australian government was having this concern and the Australian government was in a bit of a spot where they were using stuff from other nations. Yeah. And, you know, when you, if you're really, really, really going zero trust, especially in a government environment, you kind of do have to go all the way down to, manufacturing and yeah and, yeah um, all the components yeah it's just very very difficult thing to do very very time consuming especially when you had an environment that was like that and um, switching to one that's all australian made or american made yeah. um is fine and, and that makes sense especially i'd say one of the best use cases for that would be defense right yes yes yeah where you you can't really yeah, outsource elements. Exactly. Yeah, you don't want anything outsourced. You want it all built in house or in in nation, I suppose. Yeah. But um, yeah, interesting one there. I wonder what other companies will see fall under the same boat because 
there are a lot of Chinese companies and there's heaps of them that own stuff that and not the public knows everything about them. So I wonder if this will be like a domino effect where we'll see. Yeah, I think it is a rabbit hole. That's why I'm not I'm not sure if doing the TikTok ban is the route. Yeah. Um in an ideal world, I think it is. Yeah. But as you said, there's so many Chinese apps out there. Yeah. And you know, are we just going to ban this one just because it's TikTok because it's massive? Yeah. Because, you know, maybe that is the case, but who knows what data TikTok's collecting compared to, I don't know, something chat. You know, <laughs> we, WeChat or something. That's another one. WeChat. Yeah, we, WeChat. So yeah, that one got, that one's been banned for ages. I think. Maybe it hasn't been banned. It would be. Yeah, yeah. So it's like the main, it's like Telegram, but for yeah. China. Yeah. It's just WhatsApp, basically. Yeah, well, there's the Western WhatsApp, Chinese WeChat, and then Russian Telegram. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. Anyway, we'll move on a little bit. There was a really interesting attack that happened late last year, and it was by Nissan OCE, so Oceania Nissan. They had this data breach late last year. It was performed by a ransomware attack by there's a pretty known group called Akira, which have been doing, they've been stirring up trouble. Now, what Nissan has told us is that at least 100,000 customers, not accounts, customers have been impacted in AU, which 10% or roughly you know, 10,000 of these customers had government-issued IDs stolen, which this means passports, uh, it means driver's licenses, Medicare cards, all these different types of ID. And you know, it's another sort of case of a company having access to data which they don't need why does a car company need your passport or your medicare card no it's a big problem uh in australia as well where you know we learned about this in some of our later units where we go to a hotel um they ask for us to sign in they take our uh driver's license and they take a photocopy of it yeah why do you need that no you like with stuff like this all you really need to do for a workaround is have a register which you just put a tick there that somebody has verified that this is you. Yeah. You don't need to store the data. No. Or if you are going to store the data, have very, very good protocols for uh, retention and destruction afterwards. Yeah. Um, there, there's a lot of companies that have no idea how, what their data retention policy is. Or they don't have one at all. I, I had this problem the other day of um, I was asking a company we were potentially going to use a tool of, which we're not going to now, about their data destruction policies. And like, well, we delete it. Like, <laughs> great. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, no, not very helpful. Uh, a lot of people don't understand that destruction is a thing. If you think about it from like a physical standpoint, you know, mm. you can use a paper shredder. Mm. One of them goes lines down, which sucks because you just can tape it together and yeah, do what you yeah. did. Or there's one that goes crissy crossy and yeah. destroys like that. It's the same thing with um, with software or you know, hard drives and stuff like that, where you can destroy it in a way which it's not going to be recoverable, or you can destroy it in a way that, you know, you just go to temporary storage. Yeah, or it's saved still in the cache. Yeah, Or exactly. some, yeah, like forensics people are pretty good at what they, they do, and not a lot of people delete the data properly in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, it comes into what we were saying with Ryan when we had him on as a guest was, you know, car companies, they're not very secure. No. And they hold a lot of stuff they don't need to. And it's. I feel like he's going to have a really good time in, in the next few years where car companies are going to be, you know, attacked left, right and center because they have this kind of information that they're storing. And even there was all these reports released not long ago that saying that data car companies were collecting was stuff like audio in yeah. the car and, you know, certain stuff about, you know, movements made, how fast you're going seat position and all this stuff and it's like why why do they need to know that and are they storing it properly and though nissan australia sorry oceania has said that what all has been lost is uh, or the worst of what's been lost is the customer information it's very likely that this other data they've been collecting has also been stolen in yeah opinion. it's hard it's it's hard to say who knows um and you know, think about how many, you know, extremely sensitive conversations have been made when you're driving to work. Oh, yeah. And stuff like yeah. that. And imagine they're just storing that data um, and who knows where that's going. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, what happens when a, I don't know, think of it this way, what if a threat actor finds a high-profile person's data mixed in with 
the stolen data and they are able to blackmail him with you know one you know in one way or another yeah you you, you can definitely see it happening yeah okay well we'll move on to another little bit of information this just came out today so we'll um you know it might not be relevant in a week's time but we'll see there was a windows endpoint kubernetes issue where so kubernetes is like a a cluster of uh, little compute services so you can think of it as like a think of a big box with lots of little boxes inside of it and each one of those little boxes is like a kubernetes instance and that big box that holds all of the little boxes is a cluster so there was an issue a remote code execution issue where you were able to potentially get this vulnerability out of a cluster and you had access to every single one of the instances in that cluster so it meant that you're able to get privilege escalation or execute arbitrary code on any of the clusters in that uh, sorry any of the instances inside that cluster which it was discovered by akamai so you know good on them for finding that one but if you're running windows endpoints then look at getting your kubernetes uh versions that up to date i don't know if there's a fix for it yet actually and uh, probably will be by the time this goes i know there was the major patches were this week um around tuesday it's patch tuesday yeah but, so that was probably afterwards so mm-hmm. there probably will need to be a patch soon so there's another thing that's pretty interesting happening is obviously everybody knows about ai the eu has just passed a new law or they're looking to pass a new law right on the yeah there was progress in um the ai space for uh eu law basically and you've been keeping up with ai law the eu's just been ahead of the game with it which is always the case you know gdpr is the gold standard of um data protection laws yeah basically they've gone ahead and uh, have banned certain ais from being used so basically so- scoring social scoring systems like the ones used in china yeah <laughs> uh completely banned there was a couple others as well. I'm just getting the article up on it. It was interesting seeing how they defined AI. They said machine-based system designed to operate with varying levels of autonomy. Okay, well, that could be That anything. could be anything. Yeah. <laughs> That's like uh, you use a, a cron job. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, 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 have a, I have a fishing robot that, uh, that literally spins the wheels of the fishing whenever it feels like uh, a tug from a from a fish yeah. yeah that's an autonomous robot that does the fishing for me and, and yeah it's machine intelligence in in some sort of way yeah so basically they've um they've heated it as things that are over a high risk will be banned mm. but there are categories for high risk systems that'll be legal but they're closely observed uh, so, like examples like law enforcement and justice, yep. which I'm actually somewhat surprised that they're not banned, because you know AI has the ability to discriminate. Of course, it does. Yep. And which I assume is why they're being put as high risk. Yeah. But I suppose they can do a job better than a human in certain cases. Yeah. Um, some ways. But I do like how they are doing it in terms of a risk approach. I have been looking closely at different laws coming out in Australia as well. So there's the AI assurance framework. Yep. It's not a law, it's more just like a guideline about how to do it. It's a difficult thing to do because even one of the st- things in there was like, oh, does this system have the ability to discriminate? Of course it does. Yeah. Every time you are trading something on data, of course it has the ability to discriminate. That's yep. the um, how AI works. It's yep. going to have a preference and a certain way it wants to go. It, it, will, it will draw conclusions from the data that it's given. Yeah, and sometimes the conclusions are discriminatory. Yeah, it's inherently biased. Exactly. Yeah. Um, there, there was actually a really good assignment I did in uni. It was one of the last assignments I did, but I found it really good. It was one of our risk units. But what the assignment was, was discussing some of the moral implications of having like a facial recognition AI. And the specific task or the example they gave us was a facial recognition AI for high school students on whether or not they would give money back to the school later in life and oh, yeah, i do remember this yeah and i thought it was actually a really fun one because it talked it touched on issues like discrimination where there could just be any number of reasons why certain students give back more money or some don't and it could have to do with different levels of socioeconomic stuff it could be any number of reasons and 
you know, obviously the AI is going to discriminate if not many people donate, except one person who might look a certain way or be a certain gender. And then suddenly it's going to give off, you know, whacked out results for, for the rest of everyone. So it's just hugely discriminatory stuff. Good to touch on the morality. And it's also really good to hear that the EU is looking at this at, in the very least, looking at it and understanding that AI being used in certain situations is risky. It's, it can be dangerous and it can really be discriminatory. Yeah, in certain ways, it's just unacceptable yeah. entirely. Um, yeah, so currently, a lot of the methods are just making sure you actually need the AI beforehand. So hosting workshops, I would really recommend if you're going to do this, not necessarily getting a consultant, but getting someone external that's not going to be biased to the solution. Yeah. Having a look at it and actively challenging whether you actually need something. Yeah. So basically looking at the AI saying, okay, do we actually need this? Does this have the chance to be bias, which is going to, but over, you got to accept a certain level of risk. And does this AI actually do a job better than a human? Yeah. We've spoken a million times before about putting AI into systems that yeah. don't need it. Yeah, exactly. If you get all these AI products that maybe make something 1%, 2% better, would the time, energy, and money be better allocated if you just trained the person to be able exactly. to do it better yeah. in the first place? Exactly. Yeah, it's such a hot topic right now. We've said this a million times before. It's got to just be a thing that gets put into place for the sake of being put into place. Yeah. And sometimes it's about taking a step back and really assessing whether you actually need something. Yeah. Thanks for listening. Just a reminder that the Cyber Minutes podcast is for educational purposes only. The views expressed by hosts and guests are their own, not necessarily their employers. Advice discussed is general advice. We promote ethical discussions, not illegal activities. Have a cybersecurity question? Send an email to cyberminutespodcast at gmail.com as we'd love to answer it. Stay cyber safe.